Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to our session on cybersecurity. Um, first of all, um, quick uh, little overview, and um, then I will jump into intros, um, allowing our fellow participants, our fellow, uh, sorry, panelists here to introduce themselves to our participants. Um, as all of you know, we are in a digital world. We all live and work in a digital world. Um, our our uh, global connectivity, as many of you know, has doubled since 2014 to about 4 million people. Um, many of our clients and donors are increasingly using the power of technology to accelerate development outcomes, um, which um, we know have been very beneficial. Um, on the other side of that, however, and part of the discussions we will have today are how to safeguard um, this use of uh, technology and accelerate um, and how we can sustain these uh, development outcomes and build resiliency on the technology that we are deploying in this large ecosystem that we work in. Uh, especially as the ecosystem grows, um, we tend to see the number of vulnerabilities expanding. So some examples of things that have recently happened that I'm sure you guys have heard of, um, Costa Rica, uh, this month, the government, a very new government, uh, had a series of cyber attacks that after mid-April um, um, came from a hacker attack uh, at the Ministry of Finance. Uh, where there was a $10 million ransom requested. Uh, the attack uh, was carried out by a Russian hacker group, um, after which uh, some 27 institutions were hit. Um, the government, uh, during an, its inauguration, had to declare a state of emergency um, and really um, you know, set the tone for how they would um, carry out their um, their tenure. Uh, we want to highlight uh, some of these examples uh, as part of a background of background uh, of what we will discuss today. It's not just a matter of paying the ransom. I think that we will all um, highlight uh, the many different implications on trust in a new government, for example, uh, the stoppage of work. Uh, in Costa Rica's case, for example, they've had to take some of their tax platforms offline. Um, holding some taxes for now. Um, so there will be financial implications for the government. Um, ICRC is another example on the organizational side. Um, they're seen as perhaps one of the most capable organizations out there. Um, and uh, most recently this happened to them. Um, the response, uh, their response is something that we can also learn from. Uh, I think in the cyber world, it's not really about if it will happen to you, but really when it will happen to you. Um, looking at the ICRC case uh, in terms of uh, the cyber attack that hit their servers, um, exposing sensitive personal identifiable information for over 500,000 people. Um, you hit the same issues of trust, uh, but also uh, potential disruption to mission and uh, maybe even reputational risk uh, for the organization. So we will also look at um, some, of the, some of the different components that make up um, some of these two examples uh, as a background. Um, just an introduction uh, about myself. Um, I am uh, Elizabeth Villarroel, I'm from Deloitte. I'm a specialist leader. Uh, I work at the intersection of emerging technology and emerging markets uh, with a particular focus on cybersecurity. Uh, I most recently was the chief of party for Deloitte's uh, health reform support project in Ukraine, where we implemented a large digital component um, comprising of cyber interoperability, um, e-governance, and uh, a variety of other um, components supporting the e-health system. Um, with that, um, I would like to introduce um, the panel, my fellow panelists today. We have Joe Urbanovich uh, from CRS, um, Stan Byers from USAID, and Heather Love from Mercy Corps. Um, 
as a way of getting a little bit more in depth in terms of our intros, I will ask the panelists some questions, um, starting with you, Stan. So first, uh, where does cybersecurity fit into the development agenda? Um, and why is this an issue? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, my name is Stan Byers. I'm the cybersecurity team lead for, US, for USAID's technology division. Um, to, I mean, to look, to answer your question, I mean, our team was actually created because we're increasingly seeing cybersecurity cut, cut across nearly every development sector. Um, not just, you know, I mean, both the, con the, kind of the conventional development sectors of health and education, agriculture, critical infrastructure, humanitarian relief, all these different things that we as an agency do increasingly both use um, digital technologies or even depend upon them to do the work. And it's not just um, the technologies we're using, but the environments in which we're working are changing because of they're, they're digitalizing very quickly as well. And cyber um, aspects of that are, are bec it's becoming a much bigger component of the broader environments in which we work. Um, and then you have the kind of like quote unquote new development space of emerging digital tech, AI, uh, IoT, Internet of Things device, and connected devices, social media, mis, uh, dis and malinformation, or they're, we're calling MDM. Uh, you're seeing we're seeing more spyware and surveillance tech uh, in the environments that we're working in. Uh, we're seeing issues of digital literacy uh, and cyber capacity building are becoming super important. And as countries that we work in are you know digitized very very quickly. People don't all, aren't always you know, have to try and uh, catch up with this and climb that learning curve of like what does this mean for them? What does it mean for how things operate? And then for us as development an organization, what does it mean for the work that we're doing? <clears throat> and one of the things, one of the places in the development community that we've really seen a blind spot is in cybersecurity. We've moved very quickly on the digital front, on the you know tech, new technologies and how they can be applied. But there hasn't been as quick of a response on cybersecurity. And a lot of that is that you know, it hasn't been seen as something that is a normal part of the development conversation. Um, and we're st we've, we were formed because as USA developed its, our digital strategy, which was an intent to look at how digital technologies are affecting development, um, we started asking the question, well, what about the security aspects? What if we, how do we deal with that piece? And we, intentionally built that in as a core component of the digital strategy. And out of that, we formed our team, which we got established about a year ago. And what we're really looking at is that, you know, we're not looking at internal USAID systems. Like our internal USAID um, systems that we all use as a part of our work, that's our CIO. And they're doing tremendous work and we work closely with them, but that's not what we do. What we're really focused on is what does this mean for our programming? What does this mean for our implementing partners? What does this mean for the environments and the communities that we work with? And in that in that space, what we've seen again is that cybersecurity cuts across almost all of it. I mean, we have a we've developed this uh, eco, digital ecosystem framework. Um, I think that there might be a link that we can drop in the in the chat, but <clears throat> you'll see in that that among all the different parts of the digital environment. We see cybersecurity as kind of one of the cross-cutting elements, and we actually and we truly feel that we need to see it as a new development sector, um, something that, as a development community, we think about in everything that we do. We build into our program design, we build into our procurement mechanisms, we build into our capacity building, our training, all the different things that we do, and all the work that we do with with implementing partners and with beneficiaries and partner countries. That all those conversations that we have around all the different aspects of development we need to be at least considering where does cybersecurity fit into that? If we're, if there's a digital component to this, and almost always there is now, we need to consider the security um, aspects of that. Because we expect not only is this a big problem now and actually bigger than we, than we suspect this is actually much bigger than even we can see right now, but we also expect it's gonna to continue to grow very quickly and evolve very quickly. And so we have to try and get a handle on it and then build in the systems we need to continue to adapt and evolve with it. I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, Stan. A lot for us to dig into during the deep dive. Um, Heather, over to you. Um, I often see and hear many humanitarian actors say that they are immune to targeting. Um, but the recent focused hack on ICRC's refugee database show that we are actually all targets. 
Uh, what worries you about um, development data and its emerging security processes, um, how this relates to cyber and maybe MDM? Um, and also perhaps what excites you or maybe where do you see an opportunity here? Sure. Um, first, I wanna say uh, ICRC's transparency around the hack and their remediation process actually was kind of exciting. It's rare to see an organization be that public around what happened and how they were working to resolve the issues. It was very commendable and I, I really appreciated it. Um, what worries me is that we're all struggling to keep up in this space. NetHope recently did a nonprofit cyber insurance landscape report, which called out that despite the massive volume of benefic beneficiaries the NGOs support, the funds to protect that data is severely lacking. For example, Facebook spends an average of 90 cents um, US dollars per data record per year, and most NGOs only spend one to two cents per record. So the data that we're protecting is for some of the world's most vulnerable people in vulnerable situations, and it's often very sensitive data, but our ability to sufficiently protect it is often hampered by the lack of data protection and cybersecurity funding from donors. Apart from organizations that have already suffered a high impact breach, like ICRC, who actually were doing so many of the right things already, um, a lot of organizations actually need to have support to shift more funding um, to sufficiently protect their systems, the data um, that, uh, that we're having to manage every day. Um, on the bright side, um, I will say that we're seeing, over the, especially over the last couple of years, that some companies are providing better discounts on software and services that we need to employ for um, cybersecurity and data protection. Um, we've also seen good support, maybe in areas where they can't necessarily provide a discount, they can provide real-time support to us to help talk through like, like the best way to get the best bang for our buck with the services that we are able to afford. And um, that's been increasingly helpful. Thank you, Heather. Um, now diving into also a different perspective, uh, Joel, um, as the head for CRS's digital workplace services, what considerations do leaders within our organizations and concerned citizens have to keep in mind to reduce cybersecurity issues in digital development? Thanks, Elizabeth. And, and just a, another uh, uh, introduction. My name is Joel Urbanovich. I am a director of digital workplace services at CRS, which includes uh, global data protection and cybersecurity. Uh, I think the, the first thing to remember is that we should be designing with security and privacy of our program participants in mind. You know, they should be be foremost in our minds when we're uh, designing some sort of intervention or program um, and their security and their privacy need to be a core component of whatever is being designed uh, to deliver services to them. Um, I think the second is that, I think it's all been mentioned before, but we should assume that we are targets. Uh, you know, the ICRC example was mentioned. There was an event last year that was perpetrated by an organization known as Nobelium, which is likely state sponsored um, by Russia. Um, that originated within USAID and targeted, I think, 150 implementing partners. Um, again, directly targeting INGOs. Um, we weren't just uh, sort of happenstance involved in that. It was a targeted attack against us. So we need to assume that that is um, the case. And it's not just uh, uh, individuals in their basements. It's, it's state-sponsored hacker groups who are interested in getting footholds in our organizations because of our uh, our relation, relational ties and trust with the U.S. government, with governments overseas. Um, you know, we have a lot of valuable connections and our reputations are incredibly valuable uh, to these organizations. So we have to assume that we are targeted and that we are or will be breached. Um, it's important to protect, but it's also important to prepare to respond and recover. We are all going to be ICRC at some point, every one of us. Um, some of us may, it may be happening right now, and we may not even know about it. And so we have to be prepared to respond and recover. Um, I think ICRC, the way they've, they've, uh, they've done so, the, the being as transparent as possible, 
being as upfront about what's happening and sharing with the community about what's going on um, is a great model for, for how we all should, uh, should approach uh, uh, responding and recovering to an event like this. Um, Heather mentioned it. I think it's important for us to figure out how to appropriately fund our cybersecurity programs. Um, looking at Gartner research earlier today, uh, across industry in 2021, the, uh, the per employee spending on cybersecurity was $587 a year. That's across all industries. I think um, federal government was much higher than that. State and local governments uh, were lower than that. But across all sectors, $587 uh, per employee per year. It's worth asking, are we doing that? I mean, are we even close to that? Um, acknowledging that nonprofits do often get very um, uh, aggressive pricing on, on cybersecurity pro programs and software and platforms. Um, but that is a, a pretty good benchmark for what we should be spending on uh, protecting our staff, both in our headquarters and in our, our country program offices. Um, and we need to find ways to, uh, to fund programs at, at you know, similar levels. Um, it's worth noting that there's no such thing as perfect protection. Um, and I'm gonna quote a Gartner article here. The, the goal is to build a sustainable cybersecurity program that balances the value of protection against the needs of running the business. And we have to, um, to, to create cybersecurity programs that are fundable, they're sustainable, and that they support the strategy and outcomes of the organization while also taking into account the culture and positions and structures of, of the organizations we work for. It's also worth noting that, that uh, cybersecurity, while implemented mostly by IT, is not an IT-only responsibility. It is an all-organization responsibility um, and, and ultimately is the, the responsibility and, and accountability of your executives. And so if you're not having conversations with your executive leadership team, if you're not having conversations with your board about cybersecurity risk and uh, the, the sustainable positioning of your program and controls right now and how they do or don't support um, and protect the organization, you should be um, because every single one of them may at some point be asked to defend the decisions that have been made and they have a direct responsibility um, to the organization um, in, in making decisions that are, are, are good for the organization. So you know, I, I would say that you know, the, the final thing everyone should consider is really start having conversations at the executive level about this and ensure that everyone understands that it's their, their responsibility as well to protect the agency. Stan, I believe you wanted to, uh, to, to add in. Yeah, just quickly on that. Um, one, completely agree with everything Joel's saying. And I'm not sure whether he would agree with this or not, but I find it as an interesting perspective from, from conversations I had with uh, colleagues looking at these issues at the World Bank. And uh, the, the, the idea was we also can't think of cybersecurity as a set of assets that we create and fund and then we're done. But at, think of it more as a commodity where it is useful for a period of time, but then it's going to be depleted because everything's going to evolve. The tech's going to evolve. The, the, the methods of attacks are going to evolve. The threat landscape's going to evolve. And what we do now won't be sufficient in two or three years. And so it needs to be something that we continue to do over time. It's a process. The services and products that we have to provide it are commodities. Um, and so I think just we need to start building that into our thinking um, as we move forward on these issues. Thank you both. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, changing how we look at and integrate cyber into development um, is a behavior change for all of us. I think fundamentally um, how we maybe expand the definition of do no harm um, and how we look at uh, our immediate like um, operating environment in our HQs, wherever they may be, but uh, now in a digital world, uh, what that means for our staff working in multiple remote areas, in field offices, in missions, um, and what that really looks like now moving forward. Um, so with that, um, I um, what we had discussed is that we really wanted to have an open discussion. So uh, participants, please uh, use your chat to send us questions and we will integrate them into our conversation. Uh, we hope to have a livelier conversation around the different uh, areas that we have all highlighted in terms of um, how we address cyber. Um, 
through our different lenses. Uh, so the first uh, deep dive question um, will go to Joel. Um, Joel, uh, we often hear about the challenges surrounding behavior change in the process of digital transformation. Uh, what is CRS's approach and what advice can you impart for leaders of our organizations? Yeah, uh, it's, it's tough, right? Culture and behavior change, especially on cyber is, is, is not easy. Um, I, I think maybe historically organizations have been fairly punitive about cyber policies and behaviors and a lot of risk slapping and shaming. We're trying to, to not do that. I think, um, I think that uh, engenders a culture of hiding things and, and not, being, um, not being open about what's going on and reporting, um, but more trying to hide transgressions, whether they're intentional or unintentional. Um, we're trying to be very positive in all of our training and all of our messaging, rewarding uh, reporting, um, rewarding the reporting of, 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 of um, lost devices and phishing. Um, and again, really trying to be very positive about our education and, um, and trying to highlight good practices across the agency without making it seem like we're just constantly berating everybody about, about not doing the absolute perfect thing for cybersecurity. We're trying to be very constant in our awareness campaigning both simulated phishing, um, our training, our, our uh, all staff messaging to the point, like right up to the edge of being annoying. Like, you know, it's, it's sometimes very hard to find that, that, that line, but we're trying to make sure that cybersecurity and, and to, to an extent data protection, um, privacy are at the front of everyone's mind um, fairly regularly. It's just, it's just becoming something that they're always thinking about and always being confronted with, um, right up to the point of being overly annoying and overly communicative. Uh, and then finally, um, we're, we're trying to make cyber not a separate thing. And we're looking for ways to weave it into the fabric of the organization and the existing processes that, that have been in place for, in some cases, decades. Um, our program design processes, our project management processes, monitoring and evaluation, weaving cybersecurity into those rather than have it be its own separate thing. And so it doesn't feel like, oh, it's just another thing I have to do. It's, oh no, it's just part of what I already do. Maybe I was already doing it. Now we're just explicitly calling it out as its own action. So trying our best not to make it some extra thing, but just be part of what CRS does um, in its work. Great, thank you, Joel. Um, we have uh, one question that's come in from um, Abdul Wali uh, Taizada. Um, how how does this how a system is attacked by hackers? Is it through emails or are they invisible? Um, can I throw it to you, Joel? Sure, and 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 maybe I I I ask Stan to to because um, I think the the Nobelium example is a good a good demonstrable example of this that that involved. USAID and implementing partners uh, across the sector. Phishing, right? It's the simple email phishing and, and spear phishing as an extension of that. It's the cheapest, it's the easiest, um, it's the most successful. Generally, it, individuals aren't, aren't um, trying to spend enormous amounts of time breaking into your systems when they know that they can craft a fairly convincing phishing email, send it to as many you know, known personas in your organization as possible and hopefully trick one of them into giving away their credentials. That's what happened in the, in the case of the Nobelium incident last year, where um, uh, it, was a, it was a survey, I can't remember, it wasn't constant contact, but it was a, a surveying tool, a communications tool that was used by USAID, a phishing, a phishing campaign, got a hold of some credentials that gave, got access to that platform, and then that was used to send out very legitimate looking from a legitimate USAID platform um, messages out to a bunch of implementing partners that again, attempted to fish them into giving away credentials in their organization. So it's, it's the simple act of phishing and, and spear phishing that is often the, the originating factor for how we're all getting breached. I, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think that by far is the most common and probably most effective form 
but there are a lot of there are also we're seeing a lot of other ways that this is happening. Um, I mean, we've seen you know there's just brute force attacks where they just you know try a million different passwords, um, and as processing power and AI and other things get applied to this, that's becoming easier and more, more possible to more organizations, or more criminal organizations. Um, but also, you know, we're seeing things like in the field, we've done assessments with some of our partners and we've found that uh, often default passwords on their routers haven't been, they're still the same as when they, when they set them up. And so our, our, the person we brought in to test those systems was simply able to look up the default password online. He actually gave me the website. I looked it up. We found it. We accessed uh, their entire system. Um, so th those kinds of things are possible. We're also hearing that in some situations, um, because there's a lack of a lot of cyber capacity in a lot of the countries where we work, um, when organizations can get someone who does have the right capabilities to run their systems, they often become a point of uh, a point of where things can compromise. Well, not because they themselves are uh, have been compromised, or they themselves are a bit malicious in any way, but we're at least getting some reports that people are coming to them on the side and saying, "Look, we know you have access to all this, and we can either make you rich or we can go after your family." And I've. When I first heard that, I wasn't sure whether that was actually representative or not. I asked a few other people and I heard some confirmation from it. So it may not be widespread, but at least in some environments, we are seeing that we are hearing that that is happening. Um, and so, you know, and then on top of that, you're increasingly things, seeing things like spyware, where and even no click spyware, where you don't have to click on an email or a text or something to put malware on your phone. It's being able to be the fun, the now this is pretty sophisticated right now, and not, not a lot of people have access to it, but we expect that it will proliferate over time and become cheaper to access where malware can be put on devices without even having to click on it. So it is continuing to evolve and we're gonna have to continue to evolve with it. I think we're both, um, you both were highlighting the human aspect of cyber. I think oftentimes there's a big misconception about the fact that cybersecurity is big hardware, really expensive systems. Um, it does obviously include that. Um, however, I think at the crux of our business uh, are people. And fundamentally, it is the people we need um, to be able to help uh, understand and make aware of the threats that are out there. Um, so on that note, over to you, Heather. Um, often cybersecurity is equated to hardening infrastructure, uh, but human error can be a greater threat. How do you think we can harden humans and their behavior? So, yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty easy to be an unintentional insider threat. Um, you know, a lot of the ways that you combat that are things like Joel was just talking about. Um, you know, strong security awareness and uh, training campaigns, um, you know, doing simulated phishing campaigns so that you have an opportunity to let someone who might have, you know, clicked on your message, get a prompt that lets them know, hey, actually, these are the things you should have been looking for. Um, uh, there were warning signs, um, you know, things like that. Just quick, clear um trainings and situations like that that emphasize the exact way to avoid falling for those traps that are so uh, rapidly sent out. And um, at Mercy Corps, we've seen a year over year decrease in our click through rate on the simulated phishing campaign. So it definitely just proves out the need to constantly reinforce those behaviors um, and, you know, seeing a good uptick in, or sorry, uh, a down tick in the number of people who are falling for those. Um, it definitely requires constant reinforcement. But um, another thing that I think is pretty critical to talk about, and um, and I think Joel was sort of talking about this, it's kind of change management, but you can have all the best practices you want from a technical perspective, but even more important is making these things feel real to people. Um, the concerns feel real for them. Um, you know, I focus on data protection. And so uh, 
a slogan we've been using is data protection is people protection. By, by making people see that, okay, you know, maybe I need to remember to encrypt this file or set a password on it or, you know, restrict the sharing. Um, you're doing that because you're protecting the data of other people. It could be of your coworkers if you're working on employee data. It could be of, you know, people, program participants out in the field, but making them making people really feel that connection, you know, how would you feel if your data was out there and compromised? You know, how would you feel if, if you know, thousands of people knew, uh, you know, your um, medical history, things like that? It suddenly can feel very real to someone how important it is um, to whatever, whatever little steps um, that we ask you to take as part of your daily work, whatever systems we need to put in place to automate protection and security, it's all worth it because ultimately we're talking about protecting people, uh, the people that we work with or the people that we're supporting. And um, I don't think of that as hardening per se, in a way it's kind of softening it a little bit. Um, but I think that kind of driving it home and making it feel, um, again, very real to people is actually even more powerful. Yeah. I'll just add that I think, you know, that there is a, a real alignment between, I think many of our organizations have been really focused on safeguarding in the last couple of years and creating ethics units and, and safeguarding policies and really focusing on um, on protecting the, the physical well-being of staff, partners, program participants, there's direct alignment in that with data protection, right? If you assume that, that the personal information of any of those individuals is an extension of their physical being and that the breach of it to somebody who has ill intentions could physically harm them, you know, there's direct alignment between those two things. And I think we've internally been very intentional in trying to draw those together in working with our safeguarding unit to find common ground and messaging to tie those two things together. Thank you, Joel. Um, like Stan said also in the intro, I think something interesting to consider there is that this is also potentially a gateway for other things like mis and disinformation, uh, not safeguarding data, not safeguarding systems really opens us all up and our beneficiaries, the extended ecosystem to um, manipulation and uh, vulnerability. We create vulnerabilities essentially to our mission and uh, obviously to the security of the people that we work with. Um, we have a question that's come in from Susan Abbott. Uh, we know from research that number one threat to cybersecurity is human error. Will USAID offer more online training and certifications to ensure that all people have good understanding of cybersecurity basics? How can grantees and partners of USAID take advantage of digital security and safety opportunities? Um, looks like that is perfectly teed up for you, Stan. Sure, thank you. Um, and thanks for the question, Susan. Uh, we completely agree with, with what you're saying. Um, and we try to highlight that in a lot of what we what we're putting together right now and in our approach. Our first attempt at this was, was uh, what we call a cybersecurity primer. And this was written um, and originally mostly for our USA mission staff, the, our, our teams out, on, out in a lot of different countries around the world that are working with implementing partners, working with local communities and helping them to understand what the, you know, this kind of one-on-one version of what is cybersecurity, what's happening, and why does it matter for development and what can we do about it? And how do we integrate it into our program design? It wasn't, um, you know, and then we point, also pointed to resources that people can use to learn more. I'm not sure USAID is the best organization to be doing certifications and these kinds of things, but we should definitely be pointing to the resource. There's a lot of different resources out there that are very relevant to the development and humanitarian communities that we are trying to make um, to do a better job of, of highlighting for them and pointing, it, pointing people towards those. And I think one of the things we want to move towards is, you know, maybe developing some partnerships around this, maybe um, figuring out how we can provide some resources that organizations can be using. There's a lot of talk right now about digital public goods and the technology side of like what um, publicly available open source digital you know, technologies and, and systems can be provided for everyone to use. 
And you know, something that I've I've raised in our in discussions is like part of that should be cyber public goods. You know, what can we be doing um, that are creating broader tools? There were Chris Inglis, who's the U.S. National Cybersecurity Director um, for the U.S. government. He wrote an interesting article of, a few weeks ago in Foreign Affairs um, called a uh, calling for the need for a new cyber cyber social contract and saying that, look, right now we're putting too much responsibility on end users to secure these huge systems, these huge complicated systems. And while things like cyber hygiene and training and improving the end user engagement and understanding is hugely important and should, we should continue, and if we do that right, that solves like 80% of our problems right there. But to expect that end users, especially in places where digital connectivity is new and digital literacy is not yet you know, at high levels, to expect them to be the ones securing these systems by doing all the right things is unrealistic. We need to be also looking further up the chain, distributing the responsibility more broadly and developing you know, what are some tools that everybody can be using. Um, and this is one of the things that we've been trying to raise as a part of our team within USAID and the development communities, what might that look like? And we're hoping to get there, but I, we, we share your concerns. Thank you, Stan. Um, one more follow-up question. So the cybersecurity primer um, talks about censorship, surveillance, and other negative cybersecurity practices. How are you all managing this issue with your partner governments? Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is something that actually we're, we're really concerned about, particularly in what's, what can, what's we sometimes call closing spaces uh, or contested environments, uh, where you have either outside nation states or criminal groups, or even the countries that, you know, the governments that in the countries where we're working who are attempting to control the space or that there are different actors that are trying to control the information space. Um, we're seeing that we're, where we can, we're working with, with um, partner governments and local stakeholders and civil society to try to keep that space open and to make sure that those challenges are being addressed. But there, you know, something we mentioned earlier of MDM or mis, dis, and malinformation is being driven increasingly by this huge increase in available data. Um, and so that data is coming both from licit sources, like the, mar the, the, the data brokerage market, you know, that here in the US and, and Europe and other places often is used for advertising and political micro-targeting those same techniques and tools are now you know, expanding across the world and being used to drive um, MDM campaigns. And these disinformation campaigns that are very micro-targeted to particular communities um, and to drive particular views on issues. Um, this is you know, one example, but it's a particularly pernicious example of, we don't have a good response to that right now. And the data that's out there both, you know, that can be legally obtained um, from all the different, you know, apps that we use and everything else, all that data gets sold on into secondary tertiary markets and is packaged and sold on to others, but also illegally attained where it's taken from systems. And then again, sold on into these um, often very unregulated markets uh, that is used to do this kind of targeting for different campaigns. That, you know, that's, that is increasingly, that's expanding in exponential ways. And we don't have good answers for it yet, but we're trying to get our heads wrapped around that and figure out what can we be doing with develop in a development sector to address that. And one of the things we're doing is trying to build cyber capacity building, both um, with local governments, with um, in the countries that we're working in the private sector and with civil society. So that at least we can start doing the basics and then work with, you know, we will also work with state department and with other parts of the US government to help try to promote agreements on how we can do better data governance. How do we improve safeguards and get right legislation and um, other regulations in place that are appropriate to the local context and that are being you know, driven by local governments, but that are drawing upon best, best practices from other places. Um, and I think this is gonna be a continued challenge, a very complex, big, difficult challenge that we're gonna have to face in the development community, but it's important that we continue to talk about it. Thank you very much, Stan. Um, as we're nearing uh, sort of the end of our time here, uh, one last question for all of you uh, panelists. Um, a final call to action, so to speak. Uh, what is the one thing we can do after leaving this meeting that can improve either our personal 
organization, or industry cybersecurity? Who would like to go first? Joel. I'll go first. Over. I have three. I'm going to cheat. <laughs> okay. Um, and so my three things are, are sort of focus areas. I mean, my, my recommendation and sort of the way that we're structuring our cybersecurity program in CRS is to focus on people, identities, and endpoints. On people, you're really trying to change behaviors and awareness. And so train and simulate as much as you can to get people thinking about, um, about cybersecurity and really scrutinizing email and communications and actions in, in ways that uh, will help protect your organization's systems and data. Um, on identities, do your best to centralize authentication for all of your applications uh, behind uh, a, a central identity and then use multi-factor authentication. It's one of the single best, um, it's not foolproof, but one of the single best controls you can put in place to protect the, the systems and data that exist on, on all of the applications that are behind that centralized authentication. Uh, and then finally, um, it's a bit of a buzzy term, but go zero trust with your, with your entire ecosystem. Assume that your systems are being accessed from unmanaged networks anywhere and everywhere across the world and really push as many of your security controls down to the endpoints, the mobile devices, your laptops, your desktops, all the devices that you control in your organization, um, push as many of the controls as you can down to those so that regardless of where they're accessing your systems and content from, they're as protected as they can be. Stan, over to you. Sure. Um, I think I think a couple of things that we can do is one, just keep talking about this as a community, build those connections. We're you know we're right now working on some efforts. Where we're trying to work with the private sector, work with the humanitarian community um, to really and and us as a government and as a donor to say. What can we be do, all do, all be doing together to address this? And when I started looking at these issues about five or six years ago, and really started digging into what is this going to mean for development and humanitarian work, I got crickets. I mean, no one was asking this question yet. Of like, we were talking a lot about tech for development, but we weren't talking about cyber for development. Now, what encourages encourages me is that we are having these conversations. We're having this panel. Um, that this is the third panel I've been on in the last you know two months where we're talking about this. And this is important because you know this is as as we've been arguing, this is a new development sector. This cuts across everything we do, and if we don't, and we shouldn't see it as a burden, but as a it's what enables everything else. This isn't something like oh we have to do this, we have to go deal with the cybersecurity stuff. No, if you this is an opportunity if we can get these things right, it's what opens up the the ability to take advantage of all that that tech is offering, and. If we don't get this part right, then so much of those good things that tech has the potential to offer is, is gonna be very hard to achieve, if not impossible. And so I, I think we're starting to understand that we're starting this conversations is maturing. And I think the biggest thing we can do is continue to build the networks across these different sectors, work together, build on the technical expertise that's out there, and then look, as Joel said, look at it more broadly as this is a bigger issue Make it something that's across a discussion across your organizations and, and a part of all the different planning that you do. Thank you, Stan. Over to you, Heather. Yeah, so uh, since I'm third, I'm really gonna echo a little bit of what Joel and Stan have already said. I definitely had planned to talk a little bit about MFA. It's it can be, depending on your system, it can be technically difficult to roll out initially, but the initial, or sorry, the, the savings as well as the security to your uh, organization are massive. If nothing else on the uh, cybersecurity insurance side, uh, your, your rate should go down once, uh, once you have that in place across the organization. Um, I definitely want to echo the kind of the community aspect um, <clears throat> that was being talked about. That's definitely true um, inside an organization, but I've also found a lot of value in having these types of conversations with those outside the organization, you know, um, just lateral efforts um, 
I've been involved in a couple of different groups. Uh, NetHope has a, a data protection and information security group that, um, you know, there's been invaluable learnings, sharings there that um, other NGOs can um, take note of and apply to, to, uh, to their systems and teams. And um, so that's been incredibly valuable, so. Thank you, Heather. Um, um, I wanted to just add another dimension to this. I think uh, I think it's important for us to also look at it as an opportunity to talk about these topics with our counterparts on the ground. Um, having recently come from Ukraine and counterparts uh, like the, the Ministry of Health and others, uh, all of our projects, irrespective of the fact that we have digital components, uh, should be addressing these issues, like uh, like my colleagues have mentioned throughout the session. Um, it's an opportunity to just talk about awareness, you know, password protection. I think sometimes um, sometimes our government counterparts they have you know cumbersome like IT systems, so they create all of these alternative like Gmail accounts and other things where documents are shared. Um, we can't control a lot of it. We understand that, but being able to help under, help them understand uh, the risks of, you know, putting all those documents out there sometimes and not having the benefit of having a big structural support system. Uh, sharing passwords. Um, I think one of the things that we learned uh, just in Ukraine, and this is a pre-war and Ukraine, as we've all come to see, uh, is, a, is more advanced perhaps than many of the places that we work in. There's still a lot of sharing of passwords or maybe, you know, maybe there is only one computer in one facility and so everybody uses the same computer and the same password to access everything. Um, it seems benign, um, but, uh, you know, the, the ramifications can be quite large. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to be able to start talking about those cyber fundamentals um, in all of the sectors that we work in uh, as part of how we do business and how we interact with our, um, with our partners on the ground. Definitely our grantees. I think all of us have uh, like grantee kickoff meetings um, and uh, things like this, uh, opportunities to bring in other you know, maybe non-traditional partners, I think also being able to help them uh, start to understand cyber fundamentals uh, is a people to people thing. Um, so training up our staff and then having them sort of expand the knowledge uh, would be my, my contribution to this question. Um, any other last minute thoughts from, from our panelists? Just I'll riff on, on that, Elizabeth, uh, around the, the getting around creating separate systems to get around controls. I think that really highlights why uh, cybersecurity needs to be a cross-functional organization-wide conversation, right? If left purely the IT, perhaps we create overly robust security controls that aren't really supportive of the, or the way an organization does its work. Um, and so these conversations need to be cross-functional. They need to be based on, on sustainable protection levels and supporting the actual work of the, organiz of the organization. Otherwise, you create incentives to find ways around them to get work done because you're you know, overly restrictive in ways that are not supportive of the organization and the way it does work. Um, you know, that could mean lower protection levels, but it could also mean bringing more people into the protections you have in place and not pushing them outside of it. Thank you, Joel. That is that definitely. We've all seen that happen in the field, I am sure. Um, <laughs> um, with that, thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure uh, to be able to get everybody around the topic of cyber. Um, like Stan said, very exciting to be able to start showcasing the importance of cyber in the work that we do. Um, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions today. Please feel free to reach out to all of us on um, LinkedIn uh, or via other means. Um, it's a great, I think, start uh, for our community to be um, starting to discuss these very important topics. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the SID conference. Bye everyone. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>